Hello, and welcome back to AP World History with Ms. Muir. And Mr. Yarsowich. Today we're going to be examining Key Concept 3.1, so what we'd like you to do right now is pause and read the Period 3 summary as well as the Key Concept 3.1 big picture. As you can see, um, 3.1 is really just a continuation from Key Concept 2.3 from Period 2, where it's all about trade. And so we are dealing primarily in Eurasia with the same pre-existing trade networks, um, the land routes of the Silk Roads and Trans-Saharan trade, as well as the water routes or maritime routes in the Mediterranean and Indian Ocean. The difference in this time period is that we're going to see the volume of trade increase. So the number of merchants, the amount of goods, um, and we're also going to see some significant innovations in terms of technology um, that's both navigational technology and um, transportation technology, as well as the introduction of new financial instruments that will help facilitate trade. And the expansion of these uh, merchants and these networks to new areas, uh, like you saw in the class activity today. So trade in the post-classical era um, was all about shipping luxury goods. That's what makes mm -hmm. the most money. You know, right. we want to be able to uh, to make a profit on these long voyages. There's a lot of risk, um, and some of the most famous ones that you should immediately think of would be spices and silk. Absolutely. But other things were also being traded, including cotton, mm -hmm. uh, precious gems, and precious metals, and we also see um, things. Uh, like ornamental goods being exchanged, so that includes porcelain and um, decorative items as well as jewelry. Um, so these luxury goods, as Mr. Yarswich mentioned, I mean, they're, they're extremely valuable and highly sought after, and that is what entices a merchant to take the risk of such a long voyage uh, in order to turn a profit. And these days we can see the remnants of these, you know, potsherds or broken or plates or right. lapis lazuli from Afghanistan and used in fine art throughout the, um, the Indian Ocean network, evidence of the, uh, the trade that was done. Uh, sadly, uh, slaves were also considered a luxury good yeah. um, and the slave trade was alive and well in the post-classical era. Um, and here you can see uh, the major routes where slaves were sold throughout, uh, across the desert, throughout the caliphate and across the Indian Ocean even. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Yemen and the center, centered on the city of Aden in this map here was home to a slave market like one depicted in a manuscript here you can see on the right. Um, and uh, this one's interesting too, you can see that this, the owner of the ship, the sailor of the ship is uh, Chinese um, and he's sailing with slaves purchased at one of these markets. And so um, the slaves at this point in time are primarily um, being used for domestic purposes. That's right. So helping around the house. Um, also, there's a significant um, sex trade happening where slaves are being taken, f female slaves are being taken to serve the ne needs of men. Um, and rarely are these slaves destined for any kind of intensive manual labor. It's mostly sort of domestic pursuits. You could argue that being a concubine is... Maybe Demanding. Way, right? uh, yeah. That's true. That's true. Fair enough. Um, what made it possible? New technologies in both uh, the types of tools that allow you to navigate. Remember from the classical era, it was really learning how to uh, predict those monsoon winds that was the big technological advancement. Here, new tools like the compass and the astrolabe are, are being helpful. Um, here you see a picture of a particular ship innovation that was developed in this time period, the Chinese junk. And so this is obviously a photograph of a modern version of a junk, um, but the um, Chinese junk ships, what was innovative about them was the ability to hold lots of cargo, so that helps facilitate trade, um, and also the sort of sustainability, I don't know if that's the right word, but um, the durability, I guess, <laughs> probably the better word, uh, for the ships to, to engage in, like, open water, long distance, Very long distance trade. And so, and as we saw in the last period that trade can inspire new technological innovation. So mm -hmm. we see with the junk across the post-classical period, something about this size by the end of the time period is the size that you see in the background here. And for scale, this is a, a Ming Dynasty junk that's sent out all over the Indian Ocean it goes. And uh, on scale comparison with the ships that Columbus did across the Atlantic, Atlantic Ocean. Right. So. Yeah. Um, huge difference. Huge ships. 
Um, here is one of my favorite animals, the camel. And um, as you know, the camel was extremely important for trade in both the classical and post-classical period. Uh, the innovation here in the post-classical period is the development of a camel saddle, which allows the camel to become um, a better pack animal. So, in other words, better able to transport go um, luxury goods across long distances. And when you're going across long distances, uh, you know, you need to, you can't go all at once, even camels need to rest. And so we see the establishment of caravanserai. They're sort of inns or hotels along these trade networks, um, many of them still standing. This one's an example from one that's in Iran. And uh, you know, the water was important um, mm -hmm. for both animals and refreshing for the merchant travelers, a place to spend the night, right. maybe do a little side trading. Yep. Um, and yeah, these it's are all about all networking. Over. It was also, places to network, yeah. you know. Um, and say, again, also safety in numbers. They tend, the caravanserai tended to have um, some minimal fortifications to protect the merchants. That's true, and you should think about these as a public infrastructure being promoted by the local kingdom or empire to encourage that trade and protect it. Um, another big innovation in this time period um, had to deal with uh, financial instruments used to, to facilitate trade or make trade easier. So we're going to see a couple of examples. Um, first, on your left is an example of paper money, which was issued by the Tang Dynasty. This, this particular example comes from the Tang Dynasty. Uh, but paper money first emerges in China, and paper money is a great innovation. It's incredible to not have to weigh yourself down carrying actual coins of gold and silver, and instead you can carry around a piece of paper that represents um, a, a holding of silver or gold somewhere else, like in a bank, for example. Um, you also see on the right-hand side um, a letter of credit from Europe. And so what is credit? Credit is basically a promise to pay someone back. Um, and so credit makes trade easier because uh, you don't have to carry around the money with you. You can just have this letter of credit and let the banks do the exchange of money later. That's right. And these new forms of credit monetization encourage the increase, the intensification of trade. And uh, with that, the increase in paperwork and those along in the middle of the exchanges. So here we see um, this is a, a bill of exchange from the, uh, the very late 14th century in Europe. Um, documenting that a, an exchange took place and uh, here we see represented in painting a money house or money a banking house right and mm -hmm. if you remember from class today several of those uh, city-states uh, became powerful especially like Venice for instance across the Mediterranean you know it's not a geographically large area but right. they were the merchants that facilitated the trade and they acquired a great deal of wealth in doing so mm -hmm. um, one Thing, one innovation that we see are, um, is that several of the empires that we're going to study a little bit later on in this unit took a very active role in developing the economy of their nation and the infrastructure in order to improve trade or contribute to the growth of trade. One specific example that you must know for this exam is the example of the Grand Canal in China, which was constructed during the Sui Dynasty, or the first dynasty of the post-classical period. Um, and so you can see um, on the left a picture of what the Grand Canal looks like today, uh, and on the right you can see how uh, important the Grand Canal is in terms of connecting um, major cities in China. And that city there, Hangzhou, again from class today, right. a major right. trade port city. Um, and this is something that's done on the scale of like the Great Wall, so it's uh, huge. It's, huge. Yeah. it's kind of a big deal. It's kind of a big deal, that's right. <laughs> um, in Northern Europe, you have uh, feudalism is the main model of sort of social organization. We'll learn more about that later in the unit. But uh, by the middle of the period, you have uh, a merchant network of cities uh, that's called the Hanseatic League. And there's always a question about the Hanseatic League, usually uh, comparing it to Swahili city-states. They were right. not dominated by any single government. They were independent, but they mm -hmm. uh, both cooperated and competed with one another. And what's really interesting about the Hanseatic League is the goods that they brought in from, you can see over here on the right, from Asia across the land routes as well as across the Mediterranean Sea roads and the diffusion of goods there and even the creation of laws between city-states. Uh, right, to manage the trade. Because you're, you're talking about cities that are that developed in different empires that with people who spoke different languages and had different sort of cultural and political traditions. And so really to make the trade work, they had to cooperate to create these basic sort of basic set of practices that they were all agree upon um, for any economic activity. 
So we mentioned empires. Uh, this is the same image again, some of those city-states that you need to know, um, and or cities and city-states you need to know. Um, and let's go through some of these empires in relationship to these cities and their uh, trade networks. In China, we have the Sui, Tang, and Song dynasties, um, and they're at the uh, eastern point of the Silk Roads and the Indian Ocean network. And at the other end of the, uh, the Silk Roads and dominating the eastern half of the Mediterranean, the Byzantine Empire, successors to the Roman Empire. Um, the new uh, political entity that develops in this time period is the Caliphate, which is a uh, Islamic empire, and so we have two dynasties or two family dynasties controlling the Caliphate: the Umayyads and the Abbasids. And the Islamic empire here, um, starting from the Arabian Peninsula, stretched out to encompass a vast amount of territory um, that ha brought together Mediterranean sea lanes, Trans-Saharan trade, and the Indian Ocean, as well as some of the Silk Roads. Only to be outdone by the Mongols. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the Mongols, the largest land empire in in uh, world history, um, began Central Asia and stretched outward to conquer China, the Middle East, Russia, um, and so again we have this huge empire that is making connections between the Silk Roads um, and and pushing into some of those northern trade networks near Novgorod. In Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, you have uh, something that's taking place actually throughout the classical and post-classical period. Um, really, by the beginning of the post-classical period, the Bantu people, it's a language group, mm -hmm. had migrated in, uh, all throughout southern and eastern Africa. And they brought with them iron and agriculture and, of yes. course, their language. And they dominated uh, in all of these different regions. Well, uh, they uh, shifted there and uh, they were the ones that were setting up those Swahili city-states. Right. So um, here you see the Polynesian migrations. This is another group, and we're going to spend some time examining the effects of these migrations in class. But here's just to give you an idea um, of the migration patterns. You see the Polynesians sort of start in Southeast Asia and spread throughout Oceania. Um, they make it to Hawaii, they make it to North and South America, um, and what we really want to focus on now is this group that migrated um, toward Africa, particularly to Madagascar. Um, so here again, you'll see the, the darker blue arrow stretching from Southeast Asia all the way across to Madagascar. Um, so these Polynesian groups um, are really the, the biggest impact here is the introduction of the banana and banana <laughs> cultivation, right. um, which which is also kind of a big deal, you yeah. know. Um, everybody loves bananas. And uh, in this map, you can also see some of those Swahili city-states that developed. Um, and so the Swahili culture was created out of migrations and um, commerce sort of two groups. So you've got, on the one hand, Bantu groups that are migrating in sub-Saharan Africa and settling along the coast. And on the other hand, you have um, Arabic merchants who are using the monsoon winds to get to the um, eastern coast of Africa, but because of the monsoon winds, they're sort of trapped there for a good chunk of the year. And so the combination of the Arabic and then Islamic ones Islam spreads, um, combining with the Bantu culture creates this new um, syncretic culture called Swahili, that's the language, um, and so here are the Swahili city-states, they all shared um, that culture. Those are bananas. Right. <laughs> so many different varieties. Who knew? Um, another major migration is that of Turkic-speaking groups. Turkic is a language group. Um, these are Central Asian nomads, and you can see that they go everywhere. That's what nomads do. Um, and it's from them that we get the Turks of modern-day Turkey. There's actually two major waves in this time period um, that come into uh, modern-day Turkey. And you can see here uh, their growing expansion, challenging the Byzantines. And by the end of the time period, the second wave of Ottoman Turks takes over the Byzantines, Constantinople, and becomes the new major power in the region. Um, on this map, what we're looking at are diasporic communities. So we've talked about uh, what a diasporic community is before because this, ha this goes back to the classical era. But it's these little pockets of communities um, that get es established in different areas outside of their homeland, and that could be for a variety of reasons. Um, in the case of, of the Jewish people, often it was persecution pushed them out of their homeland and they had to find new places to live. Um, in the case of Muslim merchants, it's really the, the commerce that is attracting um, 
emergence to these areas and then because of the monsoon winds again um, they're sort of trapped in one part of the world for uh, for part of the year and so they establish a home um, there and then they move on to the to the next place after the monsoon winds change direction. And that was true sort of uh, in a different way across the Silk Roads. The Sogdian merchants in red there are they're the facilitators across the Central Asian steppes and they're a Turkic speaking group and uh, they're going to establish communities along at these different centers where they're going to uh, facilitate trade, long distance trade between these major empires. Okay, some of the specific um, types of agricultural products that were diffused as a result of both trade and migration. Um, here you've got the big ones that you need to know. Bananas, as we mentioned, um, coming from Polynesians to Africa. Um, and then we've got champa rice, which is a new type of rice varietal. Um, and what is innovative about champa rice is that you can actually grow it multiple times within a year, um, which means you end up with more rice and more food is more good. Yeah, more. <laughs> <laughs> um, next, uh, you have the spread of citrus um, fruits, that's oranges, lemons, limes, um, and that is all across the Islamic world um, as a result of commerce. Um, merchants come into contact with new exotic foods and then they want to bring them home. And then lastly, sugar. With the spread of these new uh, foods, you often have the spread of techniques to grow them. And so on the left you see champa rice, but these other three, chiniapas, warawaro, and terracing, are all different ways of farming that spread uh, through these networks um, throughout the world, and you can see the locations here, um, all of them important with infect, effects on the local environment and supporting larger populations with increased food productivity. And lastly, um, what would trade be without, um, you know, the plague? Disease. Death. Disease, need it. yeah. <laughs> um, always, you know, anytime you're in, use in world history, when you see an increase in, in the volume of trade, you're also going, it's, that increase in volume is going to be followed by an increase in epidemics. Um, and in this case, in this time period, it's the bubonic plague, or uh, known as the Black Death, typically. So um, the plague, we believe, originates somewhere in East Asia, um, and new evidence indicates that it wasn't actually the, the like it was like fleas on rats, right? Yes, um, fleas on the rats that carried the, yeah. the bacteria <laughs> right. that caused it. Of course, people at that point in time had no idea that that's what was really causing the virus to spread, and so you get all kinds of um, interesting medical practices right. and beliefs about why the plague spread. Um, but essentially, the... the the plague follows the path of the trade networks, both across the Silk Roads and in the Indian Ocean, and eventually ends up in Europe, where it kills up to um, a fourth of the population in, in some areas that were hardest hit. Uh, it's also important to note that the plague, as this map indicates, comes in waves. Um, it's not just like a one-time outbreak. The plague would show up and then die out and then return and then... and so on and so forth until, you know, a fourth of the population died. It's had a devastating effect <laughs> on the impact of the, the psyche of the peoples, you know, if sure. you can imagine being stuck with those sort of boobos. <laughs> oh, gross, huh? So gross. Uh, here's it in a more palatable form. Um, the art of the time period really reflects uh, the, the devastation of this, and it really influenced the mindset, particularly here we have in Europe, you know, sort of the triumph of the death, and it was really seen as like a punishment of God, and mm -hmm. uh, it, it has a lot of widespread consequences yeah. on the cultures of the places that it goes to. Right. It's important to, rem to remember that the, the Black Death here is really a huge turning point for the history of Europe, um, and you know, we'll talk more about that in the next time period. <laughs>